Hey, AP sophomores. Um, uh, here I am uh, live from my secret special office that you don't know about. <clears throat> See if you can figure out where it is. All right. Anyway, so we are going to talk about um, our first lecture, which is about Marco Polo. So let's start off with Marco. 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 Yeah, that game never gets old. All right, so let's um, uh, start looking at our lecture and get ready to take notes. I am going to give you some information on Marco Polo. So for starters, Marco was born into a merchant family. His um, uh, father, Nicolo, and his, uh, probably saying that wrong, and his uncle, Maffeo, they were um, traders and missionaries who had gone on a journey to China to... Uh, See, then the Yaun dynasty, which was run by the Mongols. And this was um, uh, before Marco was born. And so his mom raised him, taught him how to read and write, and taught him how to be basically a merchant because they were living in the city of Venice, which was a major trade city in the post-classical era. So he knew about products. He knew about foreign money that he had learned from his mom. Don't know that much else about his early years. Again, he grew up in Venice, which was a trade uh, center in Europe. And he was going to become one of the most famous explorer traders in human history. So Marcos, Marcos 15, his father and uncle, Nicolo and Maffeo, they come back. And they were going to set on a mission when Marco was 17. So he went with them, 17 years old, and he goes on this mission. The year is 1271 when he goes on this mission. So the Polos leave, but um, uh, as they leave, basically a war is going on. And they wanted to go by ship, but there was a war going on in the Persian Gulf area, right around here. So they couldn't go by sea because many of the ships were destroyed. So Marco, his father, and his uncle traveled by land in what we call the Great Silk Road on the way to China. So they go across land and they have to cross what is the Great Gobi Desert to get into China. Now their mission was to um, bring a hundred well-educated Christians and bring them to the Khan. That would be Kublai Khan, who is, was building his new empire, which is um, Kambaluk, Kambaluk which is, um, uh, today we would call that Beijing. So he was building his new empire, and he asked the Polos to bring a bunch of 100 Christian missionaries to teach and educate, actually priests he wanted, to teach about Christianity. Marco Polo has a gift. He's very good at learning languages, and he's very good at telling stories. And Kublai Khan, who is the strong person in uh, the Mongols in charge of the, of the Yaun dynasty, which takes over China at this time, we will get to that. Just know that the Mongols had taken over China at this time and had named it the Yaun Dynasty. We'll explain more about that later. So anyway, um, uh, in this, that Marco Polo has a gift for languages. He has a gift for telling stories and telling the Khan the truth. So what um, uh, ends up happening is he basically gets a seat near the Khan. He gets a position of power. And the Khan, Kublai Khan, gives him a gold tablet. This gold tablet, if you see it in a picture in the AP exam, is Marco Polo and his permission to travel all throughout the Khan's kingdom with his tablet, and he can go where he wants. Marco is important because he records stories about the life in China, <coughs> about big things they had, like stirrups, which is really big for trade. Um, he also talks about them bathing three times a week, which was much more than what was done in Europe. Um, he talks about um, uh, things like using elephant in war and people diving for pearls, pearls, but he basically writes about all the advancements that are happening in Mongol-controlled China at this time. Eventually, uh, the Khan kind of gets sick and is dying, and there are some people who are jealous, so Marco Polo has to leave. He flees back, and he goes by boat, and he gets back to Venice. When he gets to Venice, Venice is actually in a war, and he's taken prisoner, and in prison, he starts telling his stories about all these amazing stories in China, all the advancements they have along the Silk Road, stirrups and all that good stuff. And what happens is eventually he tells a story, it gets recorded, and this is fascinating throughout Europe because they learn so much about China. Now, 
It's said that Marco Polo always told the Han the truth, but some people think many of his stories are exaggerations. However, at this time in the post-classical era, it's one thing that helps kind of open up the door to Europe to realize that there's more out there in the world, and especially how much further China is advanced than Europe at this time. So that's our traveler number one, Marco. Marco. <laughs> yeah, that never gets old. All right, now our next traveler name is Ibn, Ibn Batuta. Ibn Batuta. So let's try this. Ibn. Ibn. You're supposed to say Batuta. You know, close your eyes and have me look for you. So Ibn. Ibn. Say Batuta. All right. Anyway, anyway, anyway. I think it makes more fun, more sense. Ibn Batuta actually travels further than Marco Polo. That's why we should play, you know, say his name when we play that game in the pool. But um, uh, so Ibn Batuta, let's give a little history on him. He starts his travelers when he's 20 years old in 1325. 1325. And he starts his travels. He's from, actually, Morocco. Um, he is a Muslim, and he speaks Arabic, and he's well-read and understands Muslim law, which is really important. So he knows Muslim law. He's a traveler, and he goes on his hajj, which is his pilgrimage to Mecca. Every Muslim is supposed to go to Mecca at least one point in their life. So, Ibn Battuta makes his hajj, and he's going to go to Mecca, which we'll talk about more with them. Um, <clears throat> and he goes there, and he doesn't stop traveling. He keeps traveling. He ends up traveling 75,000 miles all over this big word here, Dar al-Islam. Dar al-Islam is very important. It basically means the Muslim world of the post-classical era. And this really stretches from, I mean, we get Western Africa, North Africa, the Middle East, Central Asia, into Northern India, almost into parts of um, uh, um, Southeast Asia down here where we see Muslim areas. We see the Swahili city-states right here. So Ibn Battuta travels all over this area, and he writes his story called Rial, R-I-H-L-A, which means my travels. And he writes this, and he basically tells his stories of what the Muslim world is like. And it's an amazing primary source, like Marco Polo's, and that explains basically what the Muslim world is like and how advanced it was and how all these trade routes are connected. We got the Trans-Saharan trade route there with our camels and their camel saddles. Camel saddles, very important. Advanced trade in the Trans-Saharan network and the Silk Road. We go over here in Central Asia with the stirrups and camel saddles again. We over here, we got the Indian Ocean trade route with the Dow and the Lantine sails. Talks about the government. And the big thing is he speaks Arabic, which is like the language to speak at that time, especially in this part of the world, because many people speak that. So Ibn Battuta is moving around. He gets married like three times, has a number of kids. He's basically living a rock star life in Dar al-Islam and writing all about it. He gets jobs wherever he goes, pretty much, because he knows Islamic law, so he's able to go in the court system, which is very consistent. He's able to work in the, you know, in the caliphate at that time, which is basically the head of the Islamic kingdom. And he's able to go and get positions because of his knowledge of law. He's a very intelligent man, and he gets jobs all the way from West Africa and the Mali Empire, all the way through this area. He travels even further and writes a ton about it. So let's try this again. You mean... Maybe. All right, that's enough for like that. I'll see you guys later.